verses 4 to 11. You are to say to them, this is what the Lord says. Do people fall and not get up again? If they turn away, do they not return? Why have these people turned away? Why is Jerusalem always turning away? They take hold of deceit, they refuse to return. I have paid careful attention. They do not speak what is right, no one regrets evil. Asking, what have I done? Everyone has stayed this course, like a horse rushing into battle. Even the storks in the sky know their seasons. Turtle doves, swallows, and cranes are aware of their migration, but my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. How can you claim we are wise? The law of the Lord is with us. In fact, the lying pen of scribes has produced falsehood. The wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and snared. They have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they really have? Therefore, I will give their wives to other men, their fields to new occupants, for the least to the greatest. Everyone is making profit dishonestly. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated the brokenness of my dear people superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Thank you, Penny. We're back in Jeremiah. And uh, there's some hard things to read there, but again, it's a season. Now, for those that were all worried about my week, my Sunday last week, Nancy and I did play two rounds of the game that we were playing, and uh, I did watch both games. Um, and I didn't get my nap, but that was okay. There were amazing football games last week. If you know football, you'll get this. If not, just bear with me for a second. Because the point that I want to make is it's not over. We, we sometimes think it's over, and it's not over. When you consider the Cincinnati-Tennessee game, in the final 20 seconds, there was an interception, four plays, and a game-winning field goal. 20 seconds to go. Wasn't over. When you think about the San Francisco-Green Bay game, in the final four, four minutes and 41 seconds, uh, Green Bay, all they had to do was run out the clock, but they couldn't. They punted it. They got blocked, tied up with a touchdown. Then they couldn't do anything else, and San Francisco got the ball, nine plays, 44 yards, game-winning field goal. Both of those happened with four seconds to go on the clock. Game wasn't over. Game wasn't over. Then the LA Rams, this one really got me because I was in the middle of it. My father-in-law had been watching the yeah, second game. I had re recorded it and was watching it. He came down to talk about the second game and said, no, this game was the great one. I didn't realize what I was going to watch next. L.A. Rams beat Tampa Bay, final 42 seconds, five plays, 63 yards, game-winning field goal. Game's not over. It wasn't over. You have to play till the end. Kansas City and Buffalo. In the final two minutes, Buffalo scored a touchdown, Kansas City scored a touchdown, Buffalo scored another touchdown. With 13 seconds left to play, Kansas City marched 44 yards in three plays and got the tying field goal, and then went into overtime and won it with a touchdown. It's not over. And I need to remember that. There are times I think, ah, it's just over. There's just no hope for this. No, it's not over. And, and I want to tell you why I started to study Jeremiah, because of the pictures that show up behind me. Next one. You think about the riots from 2020, you think about the Capitol riot in 2021. You think about the Afghanistan chaos when we pulled out of there. And you think about all the things you're hearing about the illegal immigration. I'm not just talking about whether they should come at all, but the way that they're coming with the human trafficking, with the drugs, and with all the things that are happening. And, and I just, I remember feeling like this country is over. We just, there's just, I don't have any hope anymore. So I went to Jeremiah because Jeremiah was preaching to a city. Their days were numbered. But it wasn't even over for them. Because God always has a plan. 
So as we go into Jeremiah, I want you to just remember, you gotta keep, gotta keep playing. Gotta keep going. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. We need to hold on to that truth. Amen. So it was with those thoughts that we went through the first seven chapters of Jeremiah. We gave a little bit of background with the kings and the prophets and the, the, the evil kings and all the things in the time in the days of Josiah. It was really the last good king that they had. Um, and in the midst of all that, God had a calling on Jeremiah's life. In the midst of everything you're living through, God has a calling on your life to serve him and make a difference, to be a light. And then Jeremiah preached in chapter 2 about the sins of God's people. And then he pleaded with them in chapter 3 to repent. And then he said judgment is coming in chapter 4. And they still refused to repent. Jeremiah 5 and then Jeremiah 6 and this is one of the things that was even as I was coming out of some of the funk that I felt I was in Jeremiah 6 I, I found in my notes I'm always thinking about the next impending disaster <laughs> it's going to go wrong why try why dream my devotions this week were a series of things and you already heard me pray about it that, that, that if I'm just trying to do what I can do that's boring that doesn't glorify God. That just makes me feel kind of good. But if I am willing to look beyond what I can dream and know that God wants to do that, that's what we're called to be as believers. So this impending disaster, we can move on. And in chapter 7, we have the temple uh, message that he stood at the temple and he condemned the people for coming and acting like they were God's people were just outside the temple walls they were sacrificing children. It was, it was that bad. And, and yet, he's got 52 chapters to go. <laughs> um, the 52 more, Chad, goes, goes up to 52. There's a lot that's going to be said. I don't know if you saw the verse. I think a lot of people stop by to see some of the pictures out and display it. And that's fun. But read the verse. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. What book did that come from? Jeremiah. Even with all the stuff that we're looking at, God's going to reiterate, I have loved you with an everlasting love. No matter how bad it looks, I love you. And you need to live in that love. You need to hold on to that love. So today, chapters 8 and 9, there's a continued condemnation of sin, and Jeremiah grieves over the sin. You'll see a lot of weeping, a lot of mourning in these two chapters. I know I'm rushing through two chapters, but you'll see, hopefully, that they go together, and I just didn't want to separate them. But as I was reading it a couple of times, God, why do you hate sin? That was our call to worship, because it separates us from him. He loves us. Sin separates us, so he hates it. That's the proposition for today. God hates sin because it separates us from him. We're going to see God condemning sin. We're going to see Jeremiah grieving sin. And then God's going to pronounce judgment as, um, as the people. But even in there, there's a glimmer of hope. And we get to it. I hope it blesses you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the message that you have in all of Scripture. I had a dream this week where I was looking for a passage that had been ripped out of my Bible. And it just made me think, don't skip don't skip passages that you don't like. Read them all. And this is a passage that I wouldn't be normally drawn to. But I believe you have something to say to us in these chapters. Bless us to know you. Bless us to know that you don't hate sinners. You hate the fact that sin has separated us from you. The wrath is poured out on the sin. And we know that because of your wrath poured out on your own son, Jesus Christ, we can have hope because forgiveness is offered through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for showing your power over sin and death. And we pray that we would know you more. It's in your name we pray, and I ask the Lord that you have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the one whose heart needs to be filled more and more with you so that it pours out truth. I pray that I would not get in the way of anything you want to say to us today. It's in your name, Jesus, that I pray. Jeremiah 8, verse 4. 
God condemns sin. It's already been read, but I want to read it again. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, When men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No man relents of his evil, saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course like a horse, plunging headlong into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the turtle dove, swallow, and crane keep this time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. As God condemns sin, he helps us understand what sin is. The first thing he sees with sin that he condemns is a failure to repent. That's the theme that we went through. Time and time again, it's a call to repentance, but they refuse to. So he's emphasizing it again. My people don't know how to return to me. The, the avenue was open. Turn back toward me. Turn from your evil ways and turn toward me. Don't even focus on the evil. Just focus on me and the evil. Will talk. I will deal with the evil. You just turn to me. And then he, he uses the birds. The birds know where to be when it's time. The season of life when birds go south. And there are so many people out there, Scott, that want to go south this time. But you do, you, you know, be, well, my enjoy. wife went south, so I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but the idea is that God has a plan. He has a plan for these things. And that plan begins with us turning to him. We're all sinners. My wife was uh, starting her, her uh, going through the chronological, reading through the, uh, through the Bible again. And she mentioned to me about Judah. We had a good conversation about Judah, the son of Jacob, whose oldest son, Ur, it says, was put to death because of evil. And we discussed that. Well, why is he put to death? Because we're all evil. Because one of the ways God describes himself is, I will have mercy on those whom I will have mercy. It's the mercy of God that we're all here. We all deserve to be put to death because of our sin. But God shows mercy. Why didn't he show it to Ur? God knows. God knows. So we see this failure to return, this failure to repent. We're turning away from God, not turning toward him. That's the, the key part to all of our sin, the failure to return. That's what the emphasis was in, in those first verses. The next thing we're going to see is false confidence. False confidence, a trusting in the flesh. Look at verses 8 through 13. How can you say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. But behold, the lying, of the, the, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Be, and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? Therefore I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors. Because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, least to the great. Everyone deals falsely. And verse 11 is key. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I, I just picture all these people spinning the things that are happening. Oh, it's not that bad. It's going to be okay. What you think is happening isn't really happening. You, just, you look at that. And it says from the, the wise people, the scribe, that the lies that are being told to us over and over again, we, we need to call the wound what it is. It's a death wound. And only the death of our Savior can heal us from that death wound. It's not just something that can be lightly gone over. Look at verse 12. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. False confidence, trusting in the flesh. By my wisdom, by my following of the law, I'm going to earn my way back to God. That's a lie. It's impossible. The only way you can actually believe it to be true is by changing what the real law requirements are. It's an exact thing. There's only one person who lived under the law completely, and that was our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
so he could offer the perfect sacrifice. We should not have false confidence because when we trust in the flesh, we produce deeds of the flesh. Look on the news. Look on the entertainment. The deeds of the flesh are evident. God says at the end of those verses, verse 13, he's looking for fruit. He's looking for grapes. He's looking for figs. No, the leaves have withered. Nothing's being produced. He's looking for the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of our flesh. So we cannot trust falsely in our own ability to come to God. We just have to turn to Him. Sin is about failing to repent and trusting in yourself. That's a good way to define sin so far. Now, the verses 14 through 15, 17, I had to read it through a number of times to figure, how does this fit, Lord? What is this? But listen as I read. The people are saying, why do we sit still? Gather together. Let us go into the fortified cities and perish there. For the Lord our God has doomed us to perish and has given us poisoned water to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We look for peace, but no good pain. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. The snorting of their horses, Babylon, is heard from Dan up in the north. That's where they're coming from. At the sound of the neighing of their stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land and all that fills it, the city and those who dwell in it. For behold, I am sending among you serpents, adders that cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, declares the Lord. How many people play with evil? They get, I can control this. I can control this. And, and a lot of the financial uh, training that I've seen, they say, credit cards. Some people say, don't touch them at all. Don't touch them at all. They say, well, a, a credit card can be a good tool, but treat it like a snake. It'll bite you if you don't do it right. And that we do this with evil. I know this is bad, but I I I'll train it. I I'll get control of it. I'll be okay. And then it destroys us. See, the thing that he's saying there, these people don't know who God is. They're saying, let's just go to the city and die because the people are coming. Nothing we can do about it. I think about how many people go to the city looking for a better life and find it worse. I'm sorry, I'm not a city person. Okay? <laughs> um, there's a lot of good things in the city, but the fact is a lot of bad things happen there, and it seems to be multiplied because of the number of people. But, but the fact is God wants to show mercy and grace, and these people are rejecting that grace. They just say, well, God's going to kill us, so it's all over. God's been pleading with them to repent, saying, I'm more than ready, able to save you. But you're just going to say, well, nothing can change. We've sought them. Did they really? Not in their heart. Not in the way he said to be sought. They tried to prove themselves, and God has to reject that, judge that. I, I, this is a hard illustration to think about. But people will ask, did, did Judas have the opportunity to go to heaven? Is Judas in heaven? Is he in hell? He was used by God to achieve his purposes. Purposes, But when you read what Jesus said, it would have been better for that man not to be born. So I believe he did good. He committed suicide. Doesn't that show remorse? No, it's the same thing these people are showing. It's over. I might as well just let it end. And pray for the people that are going through this difficult season and saying it's not worth living anymore. They are there. We need, to, we need to be people that share a message of truth. There is a God who wants to shed his grace on you, not just the nation, but you as individuals. So is that a good definition of sin? The failure to repent, false confidence, and a failure to know God? I think that's pretty good. That goes a long way to help me know where my sinfulness is. Have to turn to him. Stop trusting in myself. Get to know him more and more and more. That's the answer. So that's why God condemns sin, because otherwise people are separated from him. Now, beginning at verse 18, chapter 8, Jeremiah grieves for his people. Look at verse 18. My joy is gone. I keep thinking of the B.B. King song. The thrill is gone. He's saying this, my joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger? God is saying 
through Jeremiah, with their carved images and their foreign gods. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the wound of, of, the, of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Remember that earlier the people were saying, oh, peace, peace. They're healing things lightly. It's really not that bad. And Jeremiah is questioning, wait, isn't there a balm that can fix this? He knows there is, but they're not looking for it. Uh, why then has the health of this daughter of my people not been restored? Verse 1 of chapter 9. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go away for them, for they are all adulterers, a company of treacherous men. My joy is gone. What he's saying is, I see their sin, and I mourn for them. I cry for them. But then that last thing, but you know what? Their sin is so repulsive, I want to get away from them. I want to go out into a traveler's place. I want to get away from these people. And, and that's a tension we live with. We're called to love our enemies. We're called to love the sinner. And yet we're repulsed by what we see. We talked a lot about that at 9 o'clock. Don't pick and choose your sins that are repulsive. They're all repulsive to God. It's His grace that we need to hold on to for ourselves. All prophets, when they pray for the people, include themselves. They're not just sitting there pointing the finger. We pray. We pray for ourselves, and then we pray that the truth would be known, that God would soften their hearts and they would turn toward him. My joy is gone. Is there no balm in Gilead? Those are beautiful. There's a song, Balm in Gilead. Going on, verses 3 through 9, in his grief, he describes what's going on. See if this describes our country right now. Verses 3 through 9. They bend their tongue like a bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land. Imagine their tongue is a bow shooting out lie after lie after lie after lie. For they proceed from evil to evil. They do not know me, declares the Lord. Verse 4. Let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother. For every brother is a deceiver and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity, heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will refine them and test them. For what else can I do because of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. With his mouth, each speaks peace to his neighbor, but in his heart, he plans an ambush for him. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? No trust, no truth, no trust, no peace. Is that how you feel when you look at the world? Amen. The lie? Well, I, early on, in, when we are going through, I said, just start, stop looking at the news and start reading the scriptures. Proverbs was the choice book. Find the wisdom of God in the midst of all the foolishness of man. The truth is only found in God's word. And we need to know that even people that don't intend to are lying. Because their heart is deceitfully wicked. Whether they're trying to hurt you or not, they're just trying to make life work for them. I'm going to trust in anything but God. I was listening to the news the other night and somebody was talking about, uh, it was a talk radio and, and, and the, the gentleman said, I was talking with an atheist and he was saying about how this, this with all these references to God and, and under God and the, the Pledge of Allegiance and all these things, that, that that offends me. That's not right. That's not constitutionally right. And he went through and explained how all those things, how our model became what it did. I didn't know how good uh, Eisenhower was. He did all that. He put those things in there. And what he said to his atheist friend was, okay, let's look at the most secular nations around the world. 
Let's just look at them for a second. And he listed them, I'm not going to. Do you want to go live there? That's what you say you want. You don't realize the blessings we have because our founding father, not all saved, I'm not saying they were saved, but they knew that God had revealed himself in the word and they built a government based on that book and the wisdom that God gave them. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. No matter how much people try to throw it out, pray. You be the message of God's truth. Don't be bashful about it. Don't be arrogant with it, but don't be bashful and say, I have a savior, I have a creator, and he shows me how to live. I don't do it perfectly, but he loves me anyway. Amen. That's a message that people can start to hear because they think the message of God is all judgment. The mercy of God is throughout the Old Testament because everybody should die, but he is merciful and doesn't do that. My joy is gone, no truth, no trust, no peace. And then finally, verses 10 through 14, I will take up weeping and wailing. Is it okay to cry? Listen to what uh, Jeremiah says. I will take up weeping and wailing, verse 10, for the mountains and a lamentation for the pastures of the wilderness, because they are laid waste, so that no one passes through, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. Both the birds of the air and the beasts have fled and are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins a lair of jackals, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Who is the man so wise that he can understand this? To whom has the mouth of the Lord spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? And the Lord says, because they have forsaken my law that I set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it but have stubbornly followed their own hearts and have gone after the Baals as their fathers taught them. This is not just a one generation thing. This is generational sin. Pursuing the Baals. It started in the book of Judges and the people have been doing it throughout their history. And finally, guys, God said, enough is enough. If you would repent, I will not bring this calamity, but they still refused to repent. So Jeremiah says, I will take up weeping and wailing. When was the last time you had a good cry? When was the last time? It's okay. It's okay to cry. My daughter surprises with a visit uh, Friday night. We talk a lot. She started a new job, and, and she's dealing with customer service and helping people, and it's all, she does more technology than I ever want to think about. <laughs> and, and yet, one of the things they trained him on was, Try to figure out what kind of personality they are. If they're a very detailed person, give them that. If they're a very emotional person, empathize with them. You know, and, and they, they train them. You read this quickly and decide how you're going to respond to them. That, that's pretty good. That's good business. And because she has to say bad things to them, so I'm sorry, you did not contact us soon enough. There's going to be a charge because of the, you know, all those things. People don't like that. She said there was somebody fighting so hard for a $45 fee, and then we were able to see the house that they live in. I said, I can't believe that they're fighting over a $45 fee. Uh -huh. And, the, and the, her, her manager said, well, that's why rich people are rich. They watch out after all that money. But, but the fact is, we need to recognize there's an emotional component to life, and we have to allow God to see it in us, actually allow ourselves to see it. And see God because he wants to comfort. He wants to comfort his grace. So God's condemning. Jeremiah is grieving. And now God is going to make four pronouncements at the end of chapter 9. God pronounces judgment. Verse 15 through 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. No food, no place, no life. The food is worthless. They're scattered. They no longer have a land. And they will be pursued by the sword. Not all of them will be killed. We know that God always has a remnant of his people. But that's the pronouncement. This thus saith the Lord. 
The second pronouncement, verses 17 through 21. Let the women come and mourn. That's what you see here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 17, Consider and call for the mourning women to come. Send for the skillful women to come. Let them make haste and raise a wailing over us, that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids flow with water. For a sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How are we ruined? We are utterly ashamed because we have left the land because they have cast down our dwellings. Hear, O women, the word of the Lord and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach to your daughters a lament. The men earlier were teaching them how to worship Baal. Now he's saying, women, teach your daughters how to lament. And each to her neighbor sing a dirge. For death has come up into our windows. It has entered our palaces, cutting off the children from the streets and the young men from the squares. Think about the songs that you like. There are sometimes I like a really sad song because it, it helps touch that part of me that God has created. You want hope at the end. Sometimes that doesn't happen. But the fact is, music has a, a healing property to it. So, so he's saying, call the women. The, you know, you think about when Jesus went to hear, heal Jairus' daughters. The professional mourners were there. That's kind of the idea here. The people are mourning. Because the, the leaders are saying, peace, peace. Everything's fine. You'll be okay. No, we have to enter into how bad it is. So that we can find that there's only one answer, and that's God. Not all the things that we think are the answer. It's only God. <clears throat> Verse 22 is just a statement about the men. It's not very helpful. <laughs> not very pleasant. Verse 22, speak. Thus declares the Lord, the dead bodies of men shall fall like dung upon the open field, like sheep after the reaper, and none shall gather them. Ever seen a field that after it's been harvested, all the mess that's left over just kind of discarded the stuff that didn't make it. Bodies, picture bodies in that for a second. That's what he's saying. That's why the women were called to lament. The next section, verses 23 through 24, this is the positive. And then we'll have some concluding verses that will challenge us as well. It's all part of God's pronouncements. Look at verse 23. Thus said the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Boast not in your wisdom. Boast not in your strength. That's the trusting in the flesh. Boast in not in that. Boast in knowing God. And not that you are somehow wiser than other people. Boast that God revealed himself to you. It's the only way you're going to know him. And what does he reveal to you? His mercy. It says steadfast love, loving kindness. They're different. But when I looked it up in the lexicon, the idea is mercy. He is withholding the judgment that we are due to give us a chance to learn his justice, to learn his righteousness. And we know that only comes through the Savior, Jesus Christ. He pours out his spirit to all who trust in him for salvation. And we can start to learn to walk in that same mercy toward others. We can walk in true justice. We can walk in righteousness. God pronounces judgment. It's awful. But even then, he says, boast not in what you're going to do about it. Boast that you can know me. Know me. The conclusion for all of this would be that we must choose between false piety and true salvation. Look at verses 25 through 26. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised. That was a, a way of worshiping, an evil worship, cutting the corners of their hair. For all their nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. 
Outward obedience is not enough. Someone came up to me after the message last week and said, thank you. They were talking to a, a, a family member and the family got members. I'm baptized. I'm baptized. And she said, I don't want to hear about your baptism. I want to hear about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. There are plenty of churches that will baptize you to try to get you on their rolls and do things without really proclaiming the truth of the gospel. Amen. It's a relationship with Jesus. The outward sign of baptism does not save anyone. God looks at the heart. God is looking at your heart. He's looking at what comes out of your mouth. He's looking at your actions and see how it relates what's going on in your heart. My devotions, one of my verses this week was Luke 6.45. I'm going to write that down and write, read it later. Luke 6.45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. There's all kinds of signs when I know my heart's not right. All kinds of signs. I can, can become dead to them, or I can keep turning to God and saying, I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your spirit to make this heart of stone a heart of flesh, to be soft toward you again. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to sing a song that I don't want you to misinterpret. <laughs> Take time to be holy. That does not mean get your act together and get yourself all straightened out. doesn't mean that at all. It means speak off with the Lord. Spend much time in secret with Him. Let God be God in your life. And He will do the heart surgery that you need. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your great care and love. That even in a book as dark as Jeremiah seems at times, your light continues to shine through. I pray for each one here that if they feel like they're in that dark season and they just don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, first of all, let them not look for the wrong light. Something that happened in their world that's going to make things okay. Let them look to you. You are the only light. You may work through circumstances to bring a greater light, but it's always you the source. We praise you as the source of that light. We pray that we could know you better by, by letting you deal with the sin that so easily besets us. We thank you, Father, for who you are and all that you will do. And if there's anyone here that has not yet called upon you, Jesus, as their Savior, that they would understand we're all sinful. We all need a Savior. You're the only one who died for sins and rose again waiting for us to call upon you as Savior. Bless people to come to know you. Let revival start where it has to start always, in your people. And then let us be a light to the world that needs to hear this word. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. 656. Let's stand as we say it.
good? Now, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Amen.